And now welcome Professor Danaher and uh, yes, <laughs> please start. Okay, thank you very much. And just to make sure you can hear me okay and see me okay, I hope. Perfectly. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this will work as well. Okay. All right, so I'm glad that you're all here to listen to my lecture on robots and moral revolutions. And you know, when I got the Friday afternoon slot at a nearly week long conference, I was a little bit concerned. Ordinarily, this would be the time when people are heading off to catch their flights or catch the train home. You usually get a lot of apologies for people who can't attend, but I guess this is a very different year in a very different set of circumstances where people are sitting mostly in their homes. So you have no excuses not to pay attention to me for the next hour or so. Uh, I won't speak for an hour, hopefully. The other thing as well, I just wanted to offer by way of apology is that I haven't been able to participate in any of the previous sessions or in attend any of the previous lectures. I would have liked to have done so, and that was originally my intention to do so, but I have had the misfortune over the past couple of weeks of having to fill in as the head of my academic department while the usual head is away and we've been locked in some fairly interminable planning and crisis management meetings to do with the forthcoming academic semester. But I'm glad to have the opportunity to give this talk now on this uh, Friday afternoon. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the impact that social robots might have on social moral beliefs and practices. And I'm going to be trying to answer this question. Will social robots precipitate a social moral revolution? This is a broader question or set of themes that I'm interested in, which is the phenomenon or phenomena rather of moral revolutions, how they occur, their mechanics, their dynamics, and the role that technology plays in facilitating moral revolutions. So I'm looking at social robots in this particular talk as a case study within that broader research theme. So it's probably useful at the outset if I say something about what a moral revolution is. So I'm gonna offer a basic definition here, which is that a moral revolution is gonna be some reasonably significant change in social moral beliefs and practices. So there's a couple of hedges in there, you know, what is a reasonably significant change? Is that something that's easily measured? Is this kind of a phenomenon that you know it when you see it? Um, I'm not sure about that. There are kind of more precise characterizations of the concept out there, but this is, will suffice, I think, for a, a general introduction to, to the, the concept or idea. Now, I mean, to get a better sense of what that means, it's probably worth knowing something about what morality is and what the component parts of morality are. So, you know, what is it that can actually change during a moral revolution? So, like many philosophers, I think I divide morality into two branches. There's the axiological branch of morality or value theory, you know, what kinds of things are good and bad. And then there's the deontological branch of moral theory. What is right or wrong? permissible, impermissible, forbidden, obligatory, and so forth. And you can have revolutions in both axiology and deontology. So you can have changes in what people believe to be good or bad. Now, I, I imagine that these changes take place in a particular sort of way that there's kind of a set of things that people value. And occasionally you might add things to that set of things that people value. You know, in some sense, you might argue that people value a good internet connection these days. But is that just a specific manifestation of a deeper value of communication or interaction or something like that? I'm not sure, but they, you might be able to add values to the set of values, but I suspect more often what happens is that we have a fairly diverse or plural set of values that are shared across many socii societies and different societies tend to prioritize or value or place emphasis on some values over others. So there can be kind of changes in the priority ranking or the um, attitude towards certain values. If there is any sort of formal priority ranking, there usually isn't. 
Then on the other side, you can have some kind of revolution or change in what people believe to be right or wrong. In some sense, or change to what we think is, is our duty, what is obligatory, what is forbidden, and that kind of thing. So this is usually a, a change to actual rules or norms in, in society. Now, the other thing as well to bear in mind with this concept of a moral revolution is that I adopt it as a essentially kind of non-normative or non-prescriptive concept. It has normative implications, but I'm looking at this largely in a descriptive and predictive sense. What, what is it that people believe is good or bad or right or wrong, and how does that change over time? Whether, whether these changes are a good or a bad thing is a separate set of questions. Now, have there been moral revolutions in the past? Well, I mean, intuitively, or those who have some familiarity with history would probably argue that there have been and might be able to point to examples. There are some books that have been written about this over the past few years. This, uh, Anthony Appiah's, or Kwame Anthony Appiah's book, The Honor Code, is a discussion of three different kinds of moral revolution associated with different perceptions of honor. And more recently, Robert Baker has written a book called The Structure of Moral Revolutions, which adopts an explicitly Kuhnian paradigm. So building on Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions to understand moral revolutions. And some of the examples of moral revolutions that are pointed to in both of those books include the following, you know, abolition of slavery, gay marriage becoming accepted and legally permitted, universal suffrage, uh, different attitudes towards dissection and the desecration of bodies. That's one that Robert Baker emphasizes a bit in his book. Public urination is another one that Robert Baker emphasizes. So the belief that this was once shameful, particularly for women and was to be stamped out and then a, a change in attitudes relating to that over time. A dueling, that's an example from Anthony Appiah, that dueling was deemed to be an important part of an honor code in certain hierarchical societies, and then it fell away in Europe and um, Britain in the kind of late part of the, or middle part of the 1800s. Foot binding is another example that uh, Anthony Appiah points to as well as a, a change or a revolution in social morality. So these are all some historical examples of of moral revolutions. And the question I'm interested in is what kinds of moral revolutions there might be in the future. As I mentioned, you know, I'm interested in the dynamics of moral revolutions as well. What are the causal factors that change social moral beliefs and practices? And I'm not going to get into this topic in too much detail in this particular lecture, but as a very abstract framework, you can think about this in terms of, you know, the classic debate about what causes societal change more generally. Um, oh, sorry, I, I forgot. I had another slide in between here, um, which had, has to do with the different types of moral revolution. So just as a preliminary, I mentioned a, a moral revolution is a general change in a reasonably significant change in social moral beliefs and practices. There are some people who introduce distinctions between kind of grades or forms of moral change. So for example, Robert Baker in his book talks about revolution being something that's intentional and guided, and it's a change to some fundamental paradigm in uh, social morality. I have kind of proposed a concept of a moral evolution as opposed to a revolution. So it's not necessarily directed or guided by a specific group of actors or anything. And it might be categorized as an adaptive change to certain social circumstances uh, and maybe somewhat predictable. I know evolutionary change isn't ordinarily understood to be predictable, but um, certainly maybe there, there are some kinds of moral change over time that are adaptive given changes in geography and technology and so forth. And that's particularly interesting, I think, to anyone who is concerned with the role of technology in moral revolutions or moral change. There's also another concept that um, Baker introduces, which is the idea of moral drift, again, using the kind of biological analogy throughout that there's some kinds of random and non-adaptive changes in social morality. They're things that just happen, they're not directed by anybody, and society just eventually adopts or moves towards a new moral equilibrium over time. So you, know, you can introduce these more fine-grained distinctions between different types of moral change, maybe distinguishing them based on how significant they are, how many moral beliefs and practices change, and whether they are intentionally directed or not. 
So, I mean, this then does tie into the question I was about to address, which is the dynamics of moral change. You know, what actually causes moral beliefs and practices to change over time? And as I said, I'm not going to get into it in too much detail, but there's a very simple and abstract way of looking at it in terms of the classical debates about how social systems change over time, which is this debate between idealism and materialism. It's ideas, uh, ideologies that drive social change, or is it material factors that change, that drive social change? And that could be understood in a kind of classical Marxist sense, having to do with the economic conditions of production, but it all, could also have something to do with just, again, technological changes, changes in material culture, material reality, forcing changes in moral beliefs and practices. Now, I don't really think that there has to be a sharp division between these things. There are some people who fall very clearly on one side or the other when it comes to this debate. I imagine there's probably some kind of feedback cycle between these two things, although that obviously gets you into debates about the deeper metaphysical reality and what is the fundamental um, part of reality, but I won't kind of dwell on those deeper metaphysical debates in this. So I, I think that there can be changes in ideologies over time that could be driven by material factors, but also changes in ideologies could drive changes in material factors as well. And both of these forces have some role to play in moral revolutions. Okay, so I think there's a question here as well to ask about what's the value of studying moral revolutions? And I'll just suggest again, two basic values to the uh, inquiry. There's a predictive value perhaps. I mean, I, I don't think that we'll ever be able to accurately predict uh, social moral changes in the future. The old joke, which I probably repeat too often, is that prediction is hard, particularly about the future. But we can maybe engage in some kinds of scenario planning, possible ways in which social morality might change over time in response to particular material or technological drivers. We can try to anticipate those changes and plan for them. It seems like an important thing for us to at least consider. There could also be a moral value or normative value to this. So as I said at the outset, I view the study of moral revolutions as being primarily a descriptive uh, inquiry into how things actually change, but it might also have these normative or moral implications. It might encourage a certain element of moral humility if we appreciate that the, our current moral beliefs and practices are in some sense historically contingent our feelings of attachment to them might change over time. Since we look back and we see the past generations had moral beliefs and practices that we might find abhorrent by modern standards. It might also here um, allow us to factor in issues around moral uncertainty into our calculation of how much moral harm we are doing with our current moral beliefs and practices. The flip side to that, of course, is that the study of moral revolutions might have some value if you have a you know, conservative moral ideology. I don't mean that in a political sense. I mean that more in the sense that you are very attached to the current set of values. And if you're worried about them changing or them being disrupted by technological forces, trying to understand the dynamics of moral revolution or change could be useful in order to conserve our present set of values. Okay, so that's just some background into the concept of a moral revolution. As I say, the question I really want to ask here is to what extent will the widespread diffusion of social robots change our moral beliefs and practices? And to get some traction or purchase on that question, we need to have some sense of the space of moral possibility. What are the, all the possible moral systems that a society could adopt? All the different sets of moral beliefs and practices. And where in that space are we currently located and where might we shift to as a result of the wider integration of social robots into our lives? Now, this is, can seem like a very daunting question at the outset. It seems like the, in, in principle, in theory, there are lots and lots of different possible moral systems. I mean, this can be proven to us historically just by looking at the kinds of moral paradigms or moral cultures we see in past societies. Also, and ethnographically, if we look across the diversity of societies 
in the present era, we see a fairly broad landscape of moral possibility. So can we actually get any sense of what the ultimate constraints are on this um, landscape of moral possibility? And I, I, again, I will admit that it's, it's a very tough question to answer and I've toyed with different models of understanding this over the past couple of years. You can apply these theories from moral psychology like John von Haidt's moral foundations theory. I know he's not the only person associated with that, but he's the only person I can remember off the top of my head. We have these kind of five basic moral flavors and societies vary depending on their attachment or loyalty to those different moral flavors. Um, Owen Flanagan has written a good book called The Geography of Morality where he explores that theory um, uh, or uses that theory to understand the diversity of, of possible moral systems in the world today, comparing it with um, Confucian kind of moral foundations. Uh, I, earlier this year, if anyone attended a, a talk that I had on for the Swedish AI Society, I proposed a different model based on work by Mark Alfano. Uh, in this talk, I want to use um, another framework, which is primarily associated with Oliver Scott Curry, I think is his name. And it's a theory called morality as cooperation. It's kind of anthropological, psychological theory of morality, which argues that the root of all human moral systems is cooperation and, and all moral systems are ultimately reducible to an attempt to solve some kind of cooperative dilemma. So the essence of this is that human society is marked out and is distinctive in its attempt or the way in which people interact with one another in cooperative beliefs and practices. So this is a, an image or diagram that I based on some work by Michael Tomasello, who's written this book called The Natural History of Human Morality, who argues that the kinds of moral systems that we see in society today have their foundation in joint tasks. So the example he uses to illustrate this is big game hunting, collaborative hunting. This, sorry, this is one of the examples he uses to illustrate this, where two or more humans had to coordinate their activities together in order to pursue a joint goal or common goal of taking down a, a large animal. So they formed a kind of group mind, a form of joint agency to work towards this common goal. And they both realized that they had a particular role to play in fulfilling that uh, joint task that common, or to achieve that common goal. And particularly in hunter-gatherer societies, the argument was that they perceived themselves if in their respective roles as equal partners that they are more or less interchangeable in those roles. There's no hierarchy or necessary power differential between the two of them. And this generates then a certain kind of set of moral beliefs and practices, a belief that you have to coordinate or cooperate to, towards the, the joint goal, that you have some kind of duty of loyalty to the other side. You can be held account, held to account by the other side. And this helps to develop the a rich moral psychology based in things like reactive attitudes, a sense of frustration or anger if somebody doesn't do their part, doesn't live up to their responsibilities within the performance of this joint task. This notion that resolving or solving a basic cooperative problem around hunting is the root of many of our moral beliefs and practices. So Scott Curry and his colleagues who developed this theory of morality as cooperation over the past decade or so are essentially kind of developing a more elaborated version of this kind of theory that morality has its root in cooperation. And what they argue is that there are seven basic kinds of uh, cooperative dilemma or problem that humans face. So a, a cooperative problem is any interaction in which working together with one or more other humans would yield some kind of non-zero sum benefit. But there is some impediment or barrier to that cooperation and you need to resolve or overcome that barrier to cooperation. And part of the way in which you do that is by developing a set of moral beliefs and practices. Okay, so I've taken this image and I constructed it myself, but it's based on 
a paper by Oliver Scott Curry from I think 2015 or 2016, where he outlines these seven basic problems. Now you'll see that there's four of them there, but the issue is that the fourth breaks down into four subtypes. So there's really three and then four other ones related to conflict resolution. So I, I won't go through these in detail, but just to give you a quick flavor of them, the idea is that kinship is a basic cooperative problem that people face, that this is kind of the most evolutionarily ancient cooperative problem, that there is a value to helping kin from some kind of genetic or evolutionary perspective. But you know, you need to be able to identify who your kin are um, and you need to be willing to work to help them out. And so this develops a kind of set of moral beliefs and practices in, in human societies in particular, where you have some kind of duty of loyalty and care to your kin and you um, are very sensitive to who is kin and non-kin. And second type, mutualism, that's kind of the, the hunting problem that I just outlined, where you have a scenario in which coordination towards a joint task will yield some kind of mutual benefit, like more food from a, a larger animal. And in order to guarantee or ensure that coordination, you have a duty of loyalty to a group, you value friendship and alliances within in groups, you have a sense of responsibility towards the group. And again, you see in most human societies, they face these problems of, of coordination, and so they develop moral beliefs and practices associated with um, solving those problems, okay? And I mean, I'll just skip to the other one, the fourth one, the conflict resolution, because that might be the most interesting theoretically, because you might say what any scenario in which there's a conflict, there isn't an attempt to cooperate. But what Scott Curry argues is that um, when you have a conflict, there's a danger of a conflict ex escalates that it turns into a, a zero sum exercise that everyone loses out. And if you can resolve the conflict non-violently or without that escalation, uh, you can achieve some kind of mutual benefit by uh, avoiding that escalation. So there are kind of cooperative solutions to conf uh, conflict scenarios that generate their own set of moral beliefs and practices. So um, dominance hierarchies are one way of solving conflicts by recognizing some people as being more dominant within a society. Again, you see that again throughout uh, human history that we have societies built around some kinds of dominance hierarchies and a, a, a set of moral beliefs and practices associated with that uh, dominance hierarchy. Uh, so dominance comes together with submission. So there are norms of deference and submission to the dominant groups. And then there are also the more egalitarian approaches to this around norms of fair division and the distribution of shared resources, which can help to resolve conflict too. So again, I won't go into the extensive detail on this particular theory, but this is a, a quick overview of what it is. There are these seven basic cooperative problems. They each generate their own kinds of moral beliefs and practices as people try to solve these cooperative problems. And the argument that Scott Curry and his colleagues make is that the kinds of moral beliefs that you see throughout human history and across all human societies tend to be reducible to these seven basic problems. And I, I find this an interesting theory. There is a some empirical support for it, which you can find in, in the papers that they've written on it. Um, looking at a linguistic analysis of the ethnographic record to see whether all kind of moral beliefs and practices tend to coordinate on these seven scenarios or types. So that's a kind of valuable feature of this, that it has some empirical traction or empirical support. What I find particularly attractive about it as well, however, is that it, um, it helps us to get some kind of perspective on the space of moral possibility and the constraints on possible moral systems. So if Scott Curry and his colleagues are right, all human moral systems are defined by these seven basic scenarios. So that's one kind of ultimate constraint on human morality. However, it is complicated in that human moral systems and often end up being combinations of these different uh, types of, of morality. And you can combine different moral systems, you can combine together like a dominance 
based moral system with an exchange based moral system or a mutualism based moral system to yield some very diverse and complex actual moral systems in the real world. And they've written a paper on this about morality as a combinatorial system where they outline the different possible moral systems that are out there. And one of the calculations that they give in the paper, which they acknowledge is just suggestive only, is that there are at least 2,186 different moral systems when you combine them together in different ways, and possibly even more than that. So the space of moral possibility is vast, but the advantage of this theory is that it, it all does reduce down to one particular type of problem or set of problems. And uh, one of the things that I would emphasize, and I think is the reason why I'm using it in, in this particular talk, is that at the root of all these problems is the importance of human or agency and interactions with other agents. So that morality is developed as a response to the problems we have when we act to coordinate or interact with other agents who might come into conflict with us or with whom we can achieve some kind of mutual benefit. And so in a way, this is the reformulation of the question that I asked at the outset is how will robots disrupt or cause moral revolutions? And the suggestion is that they'll do so by somehow disrupting the cooperative paradigm on which all social morality is based. Now, just to say a little bit more about that, it seems to me that technology in general does three kinds of things to cooperation. It can create new kinds of cooperative networks. It can grow cooperative networks, allow us to interact with more people, uh, facilitate easier coordination across large groups. It can also solve cooperative problems in different ways. I mean, a lot of the anthropological and ethnographic literature on the origins or dynamics of human morality place a lot of emphasis on different kinds of discipline and control practices in order to solve cooperative problems. And these can be hard or soft discipline and control practices. They can be you know, surveillance and imprisonment or capital punishment, or they can be things that are maybe less invasive in some ways or less powerful, like just gossip and uh, social reputation and things like that. But technology in, in principle can be used to solve cooperative problems in different ways, make it easier to encourage people to comply with co cooperative norms or increase the punishments associated with violating cooperative norms or um, increase the benefits associated with achieving some kind of cooperative outcome. And also then, and this is the question that I'm, I'm interested in here is that technology could potentially create new cooperative partners. And I see that as being potentially the, the challenge, the disruption that social robots might cause to social moral systems is that they are these new cooperative partners or they might be perceived to be these new cooperative partners. Now, Spiegel will argue that they should be and that they should be rejected and I'll get back to that in a moment. So, Cooperation is grounded, is the kind of root of all morality. If you accept this framework of morality as cooperation, that depends on interactions between agents and robots are some kind of agent. Now, I appreciate that the notion that robots are some kind of agent can be controversial to some people. I think, you know, the, the standard definition or account of what a robot is implies some kind of minimal form of agency. And it seems that Agency isn't a single thing. It's probably a complex phenomenon. Um, a colleague of mine, Sven Nyholm, in his book, uh, Humans, uh, Robots and Anthropomorphism, has this notion that yeah, robots are some kind of agent. Agency is a complex and multidimensional phenomenon. And um, robots can have some properties of agents and lack some other properties of agents. I mean, agency isn't also a, a simple hierarchy, but it seems that there are kind of different grades or qualities of agency out there. You know, there are obviously some kinds of technology that have a negative agency. They aren't agents at all, they're just tools. And there are some people who think that we should view robots essentially as just tools and not as agents. Then there are what we call technologies with low degrees of agency. 
that they can kind of do some kinds of activities on their own, perform some kinds of activities on their own, that they have to be supervised or controlled in very strict ways. Maybe that's where robots fall on this spectrum. They're low level agents. Maybe some robots are higher agents. They have a greater degree of independence and autonomy. And I guess more controversially, there's a question of whether they are moral agents, whether they have some kind of capacity, should or might have some kind of capacity for reflective and explicit moral behavior. But the, the point I just want to emphasize with this slide and this part of the talk is just that I think it's fair to say that robots are some kind of agent or minimal though they may be, there may be a drive or an argument to consider them more towards the negative end of the agency spectrum as being little more than tools. But it seems to me that it's more likely that they fall somewhere slightly higher up the spectrum, at least than the one I'm proposing just for heuristic purposes for this talk. And then I think that raises the question of how they will be perceived or understood as potential cooperative partners and the impact that that might have on social morality. So that's what I want to consider really in the, the last part of the talk, which is what are the potential impacts of robots as agents on our social moral beliefs and practices grounded as they are in some kind of attempt to solve cooperative problems. And what are the potential normative implications of this, this impact? So uh, you know, this part of the talk, I'm gonna review some studies that have been done on social robots and how they are perceived or understood to, as agents or not, as the case may be, and how this might have a spillover effect on our social moral beliefs and practices. Now, I'm not an expert on this literature, I just conducted a semi-rigorous review of some of the studies in the past sort of 10 years and just highlighted a few interesting effects or features of how robots are perceived by people in experimental settings as agents. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these studies. Maybe some of them are less familiar and I might emphasize conclusions or outcomes of these studies that um, might not be obvious unless you ad initially adopt this framework that I'm adopting in this talk of morality as being grounded in an attempt to solve some kind of cooperative problem. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three kinds of effects or scenarios that we see in the literature on social robots. One is the asymmetry effect. And this, this is a, an effect that's been discovered in a set of studies by uh, Bertram Mal and his colleagues which I'm sure, again, these, these may be among the best known effects in the literature, so people might be familiar with this. And this, this has started out as asking people about their perceptions of what robots or mechanical agents or autonomous artificial agents should do in classic dilemma type moral problems like the trolley problem. That was the original study that they conducted, but they have done other studies that look at other kinds of moral dilemma. But in for the purposes of illustrating this, I'm just using the, the image of the trolley problem to um, highlight it. So one of the things that they discovered in, in their studies that they asked people what their judgments are of robotic or mechanical decision makers in these dilemmas. One thing that they discovered in the original study, I guess, back in 2015 was that there's an expectation that um, Sorry, my, uh, my daughter is crying in the background, uh, but it's okay. Her mother is with her. So it's just, um, if you can hear that, um, she's okay. Anyway, uh, one of the d discoveries that they had in th that study back in 2015 was that people tend to expect robots to adopt a more utilitarian set of norms or a set of moral practices and they judge them more negatively if they, they fail to abide by that utilitarian norm. So that's interesting. It's a, a suggestion that they should follow a more utilitarian set of practices than humans. And another finding that they have in a 2016 study, kind of a follow-up on this, is that robots tend to be blamed more for inaction than action. 
you know, a human who fails to pull the lever in the trolley problem or push the, the person off the bridge in the trolley problem tends not to be blamed for that inaction or there's less inclination to blame for that inaction. It can vary across the different scenarios, of course. But robots might be blamed for that inaction or more likely to be blamed for that inaction. Although it seems to depend on how mechanical the robot looks. So the more humanoid it looks, the less likely it is to be blamed for inaction. So again, that's an interesting finding. It it's kind of supports this notion that people have asymmetrical moral attitudes towards robots and humans. Another uh, study by Mao and his colleagues has to do with actually military strikes was the dilemma in, the, in this study. Looking at two, three different scenarios and how people judged again, human versus autonomous or robotic agents in a military strike type dilemma. And one of the findings in that was that it, it's, well, this is actually an interpretation of the finding in it as opposed to a clear result, but robots are not as likely to be held to what we might call hierarchical cooperative norms. So humans might be blamed for failing to obey their commanders, their military commanders, even though that goes against some kind of, let's say, utilitarian moral norm in that scenario. But robots are not, they're not, seem, don't seem to be held to those cooperative or so those command-based morality, which can following the morality as cooperation framework is a kind of cooperative moral framework. So this is interesting as well in that it might suggest that robots are not perceived or understood to be part of our cooperative networks and so not bound by our usual cooperative norms or historical cooperative norms. And this might be one of the things that is freeing them up or making us more inclined to hold them to a different set of moral standards, like a more utilitarian set of moral standards. So that's an interesting effect in the literature. That's an interesting finding. Another finding that's out there, and there's quite a few studies on this, is what we might call a, a friction effect. And what I mean here really is more is something to do with the uncanny valley type effect, that people have difficulty perceiving or understanding robots as cooperative partners or equivalent to human partners. And this can slow down or create friction when it comes to solving cooperative problems. So a one finding that seems to support this, and this is a kind of an old set of studies, is the typecasting hypothesis that you find in um, work by Gray and Wegner from, I guess, nearly 10 years ago now, where they have this notion that different kinds of agents are perceived as fulfilling certain different kinds of moral role, they're typecast into different moral roles. And I mean, they study lots of different kinds of agents like animals and gods or religious um, entities and humans and look at human attitudes towards those different kinds of agents. But one of their findings is that robots tend not to be perceived as any kind of bearers of moral harm or uh, moral patience, but rather they're perceived as being simple agents that can do things and can maybe in some sense be held accountable or blamed or at least have a negative attitude towards them if they fail to do something that we perceive to be correct but uh, not deemed to be kind of part of the human moral community or perceived to be equivalent to human cooperative agents and in fact the more we conduct attempts to make or robots appear more like human agents and having patient-like properties, the more likely they're deemed to be creepy or uncanny, to use the language in, in the studies. So that's interesting. It suggests that there's people have this difficulty perceiving or understanding robots as part of our cooperative networks. And there's also this is a, a, a review study by Vice, Meta, and Wachowski, in 2017, where they argued that uh, when we perceive robots as not belonging to an obvious category or some kind of category conflict or liminal status to robots, this actually creates a friction when we perform collaborative tasks, making it more difficult again for us to overcome or solve cooperative problems. So that's again an interesting effect that we have the, initially that the Mal et al. studies that 
suggest that maybe there's asymmetrical moral attitudes towards robotic agents and also here a difficulty in incorporating robots into our cooperative beliefs and practices. And finally, of course, I just want to note that, and th this isn't really a single study or scenario, but there are lots of studies out there that suggest that we can manipulate people's perception of robotic agency to some extent. And it, key, it seems to vary depending on the kinds of tasks that we get robots to perform or the kinds of behavioral cues that they display. So, um, you know, there, I know there may be upper limits to how much manipulation there can be, but there is some flexibility with how we can cue people to perceive robotic agency. And there is an interesting study as well by Marchese et al. from 2019, which is probably worth mentioning here, which suggests that people's perception of intentional agency in robots varies as a function of the tasks that they're performing. And one of the things that they found was that when the iCub robot is playing a game or engaging in a game, oftentimes engaging in some kind of deceptive behavior within a game, it's more likely to be perceived as an intentional agent than it is when it is performing a kind of mechanical task like lifting and sorting objects. So again, our perception of agency varies across these different contexts. And so this, I think, might have some interesting normative implications. So to kind of go back to one of the parts of the uh, early phases of this talk, you know, what, what's the normative value of studying moral revolutions and the ways in which robots might disrupt our cooperation-based moral system? Well, we can maybe tie that back to some common claims that you see in the kind of robot ethics debate about what we should or ought to do with social robots. So it's simplistic, of course, to suggest that there are two camps here, and I'm not going to say that there are only two camps. And positions are more nuanced and variable than I'm gonna do justice to here. But if you look at two fairly common groupings of normative claims about robots, you see that the findings are just outlined there and this framework of thinking about moral revolutions could get you to think about these different sets of, of moral claims differently. So one claim you often come across in the roboethics debate is that robots should be tools. And we should try and push them towards the, the tool end of the spectrum. They should be non-humanoid. They shouldn't be built or created or designed as moral agents, for example. And in essence, you know, we shouldn't try to integrate them into our cooperative beliefs and practices. Well, you know, one potential implication of that, tying back to the studies I just discussed, is that that might create a certain degree of friction if robots become widespread and common and could have quite a disruptive impact on human morality. In particular, it might, so we might see an amping up of this asymmetry effect different moral standards are applied. And as robots do more and more things in society, there is a deviation away from kind of historical, somewhat messy and pluralistic cooperative beliefs and practices towards maybe a ut more utilitarian style of moral system and more of a belief in or acceptance of that utilitarian mode of thinking. That's one potential um, interesting kind of normative implication here that those who defend this robots should be tools angle um, might run into a problem in that you know, the less mechanical or less, or sorry, the more mechanical, the more non-human we build our robots and the more things that they do, the more amping up of, of this asymmetry effect that you get. And the other uh, kind of set of moral claims that are somewhat common is that, you know, maybe, Maybe we should design robots to be more kind of independent and humanoid and cooperative partners, and we should take their agency and maybe ultimately their moral patience more seriously. One of the implications here, though, is that um, there's a lot of potential friction or a lot of hurdles to that kind of incorporation or acceptance of robots into our cooperative 
networks. And you'd have to work hard to overcome that friction effect. And this could, I think, lead to either a problem around increasing discrimination or negative attitudes towards robots, a failure to accept them and a kind of disvaluing of them in society, which you know, we see some evidence of that already. Or it could see, uh, result in, if we can overcome the friction and increasing acceptance and where we kind of incorporate or integrate robots into our cooperative networks. And that might be the least morally disruptive scenario if they can be viewed as part of our, our ordinary cooperative uh, beliefs and practices. All right, so that's the end of my talk. That's the basic framework that I wanted to share with you and some potential implications of that framework. I'm gonna leave it there and thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions you might have.